I'll try to cut off a little earlier this time so we can handle more questions. But we are focusing this time on creation, the creation of stories. Now, primarily I write or have written over the last 10 years fantasy novels. I've done other stuff too, uh, but mostly fantasy novels. And the reason why I write fantasy novels is because I'm a realist. <laughs> so I live in a fantasy story, and so do you. And so I like to imitate the fantastical with the fantastical. So, yeah, I change it, obviously. You morph things. I change the kind of magic in 100 Cupboards from the kind of magic that is around you right now, from the kind of magic that's in the Old Testament. But it's still a conversion from fantasy to fantasy. One of the biggest mistakes we made, I think, in, in the arts, at least in the narrative arts, in recent history was, a, was conceding the term realism. The term realism means what? When I say, oh, this story belongs in that section of the library, it's realism. What does that tell you? Anyone? Maybe that it's nonfiction? It's a term for fiction specifically, but yes, all nonfiction would be by definition realism, but when it's a novel, if I say this novel is realism, there's no supernatural of any kind. So there's no magic, there's no soul, there's no God, and we're gonna call that realistic. So the word we use for a world with no supernatural whatsoever is realism, and the word that we use for a world with some magic in it is always fantasy. Because fantasy is a word we all know that equates with false. <laughs> so whenever we're doing fantasy, that's a fantasy. We're saying it's completely fallacious, it's false, fantastical, and so on. But we live in a fantastical place. We live in a fantasy world. And you can't get around that. We do. You have a soul. There is a resurrection from the dead. This whole place was spoken by an artist. Caterpillars actually turn into butterflies. And if you hadn't been told that at a very young age, you wouldn't necessarily believe it. Gorillas were filed under cryptozoology for a very long time. You know what cryptozoology is? Anybody? Somebody? Rory, what is cryptozoology? <laughs> Study of animals that may or may not exist, but the people who love cryptozoology add the may part of that, and everybody else says just animals that don't exist. The study of mythical beasts and animals that don't really exist, but some idiots think they do. And gorillas were in that category for a long time. People were like, yeah, right. The platypus was in that category. The only reason why butterflies are not in that category is because they're everywhere. But the fact that there's this wriggly fat worm that just kind of goes around eating green things until it turns into soup, uh, then reconstitutes itself as a brightly colored flying object that knows the way to Mexico, and really, really wants to get there <laughs> is bizarre. The fact that these butterflies all go to the same spot in Mexico from Eastern Canada to Western Canada, the entire North American continent, they're all funneling down. A lot of times it takes four generations for them to get there and each new generation knows they're supposed to be going to Mexico and they, they keep going and going and going until they finally get there. It's like, oh, fantastic. Now the Orioles can eat us. <laughs> but it's, uh, which they do. But it's, um, we, believe, we believe it because it's everywhere. But if it wasn't, if butterflies only existed high in the Andes, they would have been cryptozoology classified for a long time. We live in a fantasy world. Tadpoles turn into frogs. 
you have eyeballs. <laughs> it's just a weird, weird world. And more than that, it's a spiritual place. So it is spiritual. There is a spir spiritual component, and that's realism. So I know somebody here has heard me say this somewhere, so you can just shout it out. Where is the first wizard duel in literature? Moses. Moses. First wizard duel in literature is Moses. That's where Gandalf comes from. And that's where Dumbledore, the gayer knockoff of Gandalf, comes from. <laughs> if Rowling is to be... If, uh, if Rowling is to be believed. So if J.K. Rowling is to be believed, that's where Dumbledore comes from. The gay part. That's the part that I don't believe from her. But it's, uh, that's where Dumbledore comes from. From Gandalf on the literary influence level. And Gandalf comes from Moses. The story of Moses is a story of an old man with a giant beard in a robe walking in out of the wilderness into the court of the most powerful emperor on the planet, leaning on what? A magic staff. Don't say staff. Come on. It's a magic staff. And Pharaoh looks at him and Pharaoh says, what? He doesn't say, bring me my swordsman. Bring me the archers. We have to shoot this old man with the stick. He recognizes Moses as someone who's going to require magicians. So he calls his magicians. And those were some bad dudes. If you get your exegesis from the movie Prince of Egypt, <laughs> which you, I don't think I should need to say this, which you should not do. You should not get your exegesis from the Prince of Egypt. But if you were to get your exegesis there, you would think that Pharaoh's magicians did some card tricks. The equivalent of card tricks. They're doing some sleights of hand. They don't really turn the water into blood. They have red powder. They throw it in. They make it red. But in Scripture, these are guys who can actually, by occult, demonic, magical power, turn water into blood. These are guys who can take a stick and make it into a snake. But Moses has a meaner stick. <laughs> so Moses turns a stick into a meaner snake. I really like this scene. It'd be a great scene in Harry Potter where Harry's wand ate the other people's wands. <laughs> That's a great way to disarm people. It's fantastic. But anyway... Moses turns his stick into a bigger, meaner snake, but those guys could actually do the snake trick, which is intense. You can see why Pharaoh was fairly confident when he sent them out to face the weird old guy from the desert. Now, if you think about your standards of right and wrong, and remember the last talk where I was talking about the taste of God, what's good and what's evil should be established by God, not by New York publishing houses, not even if they're publishing English authors and not by L.A. So if I take this story and I put it into Harry Potter world, and I tell you, okay, so new wizard, new character, new character in Harry Potter. He shows up, and he turns the pond at Hogwarts into blood, and all the fish die. Good guy or bad guy? Mm, not in the Harry Potter world. In this world, good guy. In Harry Potter world, if that's where you get your standard of good and evil, bad guy. Later on, oh, it gets worse. He calls down the angel of death. And he kills every kid who was first born in the entire place. Bad guy. Death eater. No, that was Moses. One of the fathers of our faith did that. But don't worry, he gave all the people a talisman. He gave them a charm. He told them what to do with the sheep blood. They had to kill an animal and do a blood ritual to protect themselves from the angel of death he was about to call down. 
also good. What was the one bad thing he did with magic? He hit a rock. <laughs> so think about where your scruples are. Think about what you identify as good and what God identifies as good. What you identify as evil and what God identifies as evil. Calling down the angel of death. Good. Hitting the rock in frustration. You don't get to go to the promised land. <laughs> I assume that none of you are back in your dorm rooms at night trying to call down the angel of death. <laughs> but I also assume that all of you are guilty of hitting a rock. And I mean that metaphorically. Just being a snotty teenager, doing something stupid, you're like, eh, oh. Yeah, that kept Moses out of the promised land. That sin. The sin of overreach and, well, to use the technical term, pissiness. Being kind of snotty. Yeah, getting frustrated. Yep, bad. You are a bad wizard. Like Moses was there. So that's where God draws the line. But the, one of the big important lessons is, this is a fantasy novel. We live in a fantasy story. Later on, on a literary level, we encounter the origin of all superhero stories. So, historically speaking, literary genre, superheroes came from, from what kind of story? Where did it come from? Origin. Anybody know the origin of superhero stories? What's the... I'm, Think modern history. I'm talking like current Marvel movies. Where did they come from? Where do they originate? Comic books. First superhero, first superhero story in the modern age. Superman. Superman. Before that, a, a story called The Golem of Prague. <laughs> yes. And then that carried with the Jews from Eastern Europe into New York, Brooklyn specifically, these young Jewish boys would make up Messiah stories. They'd make up the idea, because they were so persecuted in Eastern Europe and had been kicked around for a long time. And they'd come to the New World, and the first one happened in the 19th century in Prague. That was one of the first stories they told themselves of a, of a Messiah coming, of a judge, like from the book of Judges, a Samson. They wanted a Samson. Where do you think the kryptonite thing comes from? Why did superheroes have to have, like, weaknesses? They would come in. They also, incidentally, always had women problems. <laughs> Usually a relationship they were struggling to make work or they couldn't tell her the full truth or whatever. She, we we kind of neutered the Delilah aspect a little bit. So she's, it's never just an evil chick like it was there. But it's a girl and there's confusions and it's so hard. It's like it all, it all comes from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is true. And there's all this variations and riffing till we have all the Avengers nonsense that we have currently, and it's way over the top. And, you know, what's the biggest word you can think of for a war? Infinity. <laughs> it's the infinity one. The big war. We're done with, like, great war, world war, infinity one. Next, it'll be like, the quantum war. <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. I don't know what they're going to name it after Infinity War. It's going to be kind of a hard one to one-up, but uh, I'm sure they will. They'll be like, Infinity plus one, <laughs> whatever it is. But anyway, the genre of superheroes originates in history. It originates here. We love to think of our realities as boring and monotonous, and so we want to use stories as escapism. We should not. That's not what stories are for. Stories are not for escape from your otherwise boring, awful life. That's not how we're supposed to use them. You should wake up to the reality in which you exist, and this should happen first thing. So right here, I have a little magic box. This is an artificial brain made out of sand and lightning. 
for real. Right here, that's a crystal. Is that a magic y word? Yes. This is a crystal. It captures light in a crystal. Then the little sand and lightning brain translates in a made up language, translates that light into instructions that can be translated by another imaginary brain, instructions how to duplicate that light and imitate it. And then I can throw those instructions off of a satellite and bounce them around the globe and it can make my wife's magic box go <laughs> And I can grab the light bouncing off of my face with a crystal, throw it through the sky, and her box vibrates, and she looks at it, and it's me going, hey. <laughs> or some other very important thing. <laughs> we use keys all the time to start explosions that we will ride around on. And we have mufflers so we don't have to really hear them. But we get into a metal box. We don't really think about the fact that the dwarves of our society had to like rip down a mountain in Montana to get this much metal, send it to volcanoes in Detroit to be molten and then bent around into a shape, melt a bunch of sand to make that glass to keep the wind off your face, fill it with explosives that we made from the goop that was made in the time of Noah. So there was a flood that picked up forests that smashed them and turned them into goop. And then we drill down deep and pull that stuff up and we put it in refineries that look like Mordor with these smokestacks just going like <laughs> belching fire. And then they ship it to you and you pay $3 and something for a gallon of this highly explosive liquid which you pour into your little metal box and then you take a key, another magical word, and you start the explosions and then you ride them around. <laughs> and you sit there, and you have a little, just steering these explosions if you're old enough, or in the back seat if you're still one of those chumps. <laughs> the back seat of the minivan while mom drives, and you sit there while mom steers the explosions, and you say things like, oh, this is so long. If you've flown enough times, you start to get bored with that too, where we take a big metal tube the size of 10 school buses, fill it with super explosives, and then some woman comes or some dubious man comes and says, buckle up, click, click it right here because we're gonna light the explosions and this little piece of fabric is gonna save you when we light the explosions and jump a continent. If something goes wrong, don't worry, you'll be stuck. <laughs> so, click. Light the explosions. There we go. We jump a continent. No problem. That's our world right now. If I told Frodo Baggins about one of your days, one, take the hobbit who overthrew Sauron and told him about your day, he would say something like, I wish I lived in a magical world like that, because I have to sit around and wait for an eagle. <laughs> and they cannot be scheduled. It'd be nice if they could be scheduled, but they cannot. There was not an app for that. He just had to wait. Otherwise, he could have just flown, just dropped the ring in from the beginning. He couldn't even drive. He had to walk. He had to walk the whole way, just painful. But anyway, the point is, you live in a fantasy world, and it's not just the Old Testament. It's not just the Old Testament. It's you now, in your world now. But you're used to it. And so you're bored with it. And so you don't pay attention. That's why I write fantasy stories. Now, if you want to be a creator, and I have told you already that all of you are, you're all made in the image of God, and God is a storyteller. And all of you tell stories. And you tell stories all the time, every day, every second of every day. You write dialogue real time without a chance at an edit. You say so many stupid things <laughs> where your dialogue could be greatly improved. But you still, you write that scene where you walked in and you said that. You say, you know what I really want to be? I really want to be the fussy girl. Can I be the girl who always makes a scene and is overdramatic about gluten? 
That'd be great. Oh, me, pick me. I want to be that girl. Or I want to be like the snotty, you know, I was going to say smart ass. Am I allowed to say smart ass, Kay? Let's say it for the third time. You're going to be that, uh, that snotty, smart ass guy who pretends like he's too cool to work hard. Who just likes to sit back and make girls insecure by being like, And then explains to other people later, it's like, no, if you neg them, if you're super negative about them, they really want your approval, and oh, yeah. <laughs> Girls, that's a thing. Yeah, that's not a great character. That's stupid. I want to be the guy who's too scared to make a decision. <laughs> That'll be a fun novel. And it's going to last forever, because God's very patient, so you've got 80 years of being the guy too scared to make a decision. And you have to read, in order to do the whole story, you have to read every second of every 24-hour period. For 80 years, you're going to be that boring, terrible character. All of you are authors. God, because he is as giving as he is, and because he has the sense of humor that he has, made you. And he gives you day after day after day. And he gives you scene after scene after scene. You just had lunch. You guys wrote a bunch of dialogue over lunch. If I followed you around with a camera and a really tight lens, everybody would get to know like, how you chew. And, and if, they, if they watched you the way they watch a character in a film, they would draw all sorts of conclusions about you the way they're supposed to. Because when a character is always talking and chewing with his mouth open, just like, I'm talking at the same time, we're all, spo we're all supposed to judge them. In a movie, we're all supposed to say, oh man, his poor parents. <laughs> and that's how it goes. Like you're writing scenes all the time. And what we talked about last time, getting the taste of God, like trying to acquire the taste of God, is going to affect how you write those scenes. So if you want to write books, you want to write novels, start now and never quit. Go and go and go and go. It's hard, it's long, it takes a long time. Don't be impatient. I remember getting really frustrated in the eighth grade that I was not as good as C.S. Lewis. <laughs> I wasn't, and that shouldn't have bothered me at the time. It's like being bothered in the eighth grade that you can't dunk yet. Shouldn't bother you, you're in eighth grade. You want to be patient, you want to go hard, you can write those novels, you want to work, you want to work, you want to work. But as you design those stories, you should be consciously imitating the stories of God, the tastes of God. You should be constantly trying to honor the honorable and damn the damnable. You should be constantly trying to love the lovely and kick down the loathsome in your fiction. But you should be doing that in your lives too. Because even if you have no aspirations to write a novel, you do need to learn how to write a story because you're doing it. So you should maybe work at getting good at it. Actually see the scenes that you're in. See the character that you're being in those scenes. Who have you just become? The person who puts other people out? The obsessive compulsive guy who freaks out at people? The one who resents their mom? Like, what's your character? Because God gave you the ability to write it, to craft this character. And there's things you can't change, lots of them, like how tall you are. Like whether or not you get a brain tumor. You can't change those things. But you can write the scenes and you can decide what kind of character you're going to be as you go through that. Are you going to be the one who freaks out at little sisters? Are you going to be that one? Are you going to be the one who's super bossy? Are you going to be the one who's disrespectful to your parents? Are you going to be that guy? Is that the miniseries you want to produce? You might never make a miniseries for Netflix or for some big network or studio, but you're making one for God now and the, with an audience of everyone around you. And every one of your decisions and your character attributes is going to define everyone who comes after you. Everybody you touch and all those scenes, you're writing all of them. You're all authors. You're all filmmakers. These are real scenes that you're in control of. So what we talked about last time matters a lot. How you refine your tastes, what you love, and what you hate 
matters a lot. And you should be constantly trying to perform. You're constantly on camera trying to perform in a way that honors God. And even if sometimes it feels shallow because you're like, you know, but I don't genuinely, authentically feel like being polite to the waitress. I don't care. And neither does God. Be polite to the waitress. Even if you feel like, but in my heart I was screaming. But out here I said, thank you. That's not hypocrisy. That's called self-control. That's the anti-inside out. <laughs> Call back. <laughs> okay, so then as far as films go, movies, if you want to make movies and you want to write novels, I'm going to leave you here and then we'll do questions. The question is why? God has you writing a real one right now. Why do you want to write books? Why do you want to make movies? Is it because, do you know what would be really nice in my life? Some fame. That'd be fantastic. I'd love to be famous. No, it actually sucks. And it's a weird God to chase. And it tells you your motivations are all wrong. Like, you like baking cookies? Why do you like baking cookies? To be famous. <laughs> okay, that's not going to work. You should want to write or make movies for the same reason that you would want to bake cookies. Because I would like to give people, you know, people things that taste great. I love cooking for people. I love giving them things that make them better, that fill them up, that are wholesome, that are edifying, that honor God. I love making cookies because I love other people eating. That should be the kind of motivation that motivates you to tell stories. You shouldn't be wanting to be famous. That's not the goal. When I write a novel, I feel like I'm cooking casseroles for hundreds of thousands of people. I'm not doing some really foofy, foofy, fancy thing. I'm trying to like mass produce something that will hopefully feed millions of kids. It will hopefully help shape their imaginations. It will hopefully influence them. Why? Because they're all telling stories with their lives. And I want to touch that part of their brain and that part of their imagination where they decide what they love and what they hate. They decide what they want and what they don't want, what they want to be like and what they don't want to be like. And fiction is a great way to catechize those desires. When you read novels, you're being affected. You're being touched physically by words. Good, good authors can write to all five of your senses and you can, feel like you're so, you can feel like you're somewhere. You can have physical experiences for, off of a page because that page hits your imagination, the imagination touches, touches your senses, and you end up with goosebumps on the back of your neck. Or you end up hungry or stressed out with your knee bouncing because it's such a tense scene. Like, words physically affect you. And why does it matter? Why tell people stories? Why would I go around the country for the last 10 years talking to kids in public schools about 100 cupboards or Ashtown burials or Outlaws of Time? Why? I'm just trying to hand out cookies. That's all. They get handed all sorts of garbage right now. They get handed like the, the worldview equivalent of kale chips. <laughs> and so I have to say it's really fun to be the cookie guy who shows up where I can show up in some big school in some big city and be like, hey, I brought cookies. I'm not trying to force some ideological progressivism on you. It's just cookies. Like, yeah, here you go. It's not just cookies. There's good guys and there's bad guys. There's evil that fails. There's good that triumphs. There's relationships between siblings that are maintained. There's apology scenes and forgiveness scenes. There's all sorts of places where kids from otherwise wildly dysfunctional backgrounds could see something healthy for the first time, could experience it and want it, and then pursue that. So that's the motivation. That's my motivation. And if you want to make movies, if you want to write books, that should be yours too. It's not always easy. You can get super competitive and you can start wanting to like outsell other people and do a better job and you can turn it into a contest. That's, that's a slippery slope that you don't want to go down. You want to just create things that are good for other people. Why? Because they're storytellers too. 
and you want them to tell better stories with their lives, ultimately. So I don't write realism because it's not realistic. I write fantasy novels that are no more far-fetched than the Old Testament or the New Testament. That's what I'm doing. Now, I'm not trying to write Old Testament stories and make up new ones. I'm imitating the genre. A few little fun tidbits for you all from the Old Testament. Are you familiar with the story of Elisha in his cave with his servant? And he comes out and he looks and the king's army is there to kill him. And his servant is freaking out. You know this story? You should know this story. The servant's freaking out and Elisha is not freaking out. And then he, he prays and says, Lord, open his eyes. And the servant's eyes are opened to what's actually happening. And he sees that there are more, there's a bigger army, and there's more angels and fiery horses with Elisha on the mountain than there are demons with the king's army. So there's a few lessons here about the world in which you live. One is, there were demons riding with the king's army. That's kind of frightening. Two, there's such a thing as angel horses. <laughs> and then three, that stuff is going on around you all the time, but your eyes are closed. That stuff is out there. There are demons who are not allowed to touch you because you belong to Christ. They're there. They could be seen. There are more with you than there are with them. But fiery horses exist. They're a real thing. Anybody know how many times unicorns occur in Scripture? Incorrect. But it's better than none. Anybody else? You. Seven. Seven's a good guess. I've heard people say nine. I think it's closer to six in that range. Unicorns in the Bible. Also dragons and also satyrs. But don't worry. The very protective translators have removed those from your Bibles for you in modern translations because that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing that there are unicorns in Job that there's a unicorn in Psalm 22. Talking about unicorns in Psalm 22, not oxes, bulls? Yeah, unicorn. Job gets a little lesson when God asks him, can you harness the unicorn and make him plow your field? And it's a rhetorical question. The answer is no. It's probably a rhino, I'm guessing and that would be difficult to plow with. They're just stubborn and stupid and have bad vision. It's not because it's a foofy My Little Pony that you're not allowed to put a harness on. But the rhetorical question is, can you? Modern translators want to get out of that fact really, really very much, and so they translate it, oxen. Because did you know that when a bull stands sideways, the horns line up and it looks like one horn? Mm -hmm. That's why it's, we're going to translate unicorn as ox. And then God says to Job, can you harness the ox and make him plow your field? And the answer is from Job, well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've domesticated them for quite some time. What do you think I'm plowing with? <laughs> I'm also making ice cream. It's bizarre. But Christians really don't want this to be a fantastical place. They want to be respected by the materialists respected by the realists. And so they work very hard to get all the magic out of the Bible, all the magic -y bits, to deny all that stuff. And that is absolutely foolish. We can't be that way. Remember that you live in a world that God made that's full of bizarre cheat codes and creatures, and you can take it for granted. Do you like ice cream? Yes, we all do. Who invented ice cream? God. And it took us a while. It took us a while to find. This world is like a massively complex video game where the early levels are kind of obvious and easy. It's easy to collect coins because you're standing there naked in a garden, but there's this bird that just drops like pre-wrapped balls of protein out of its rear end. 
Like, oh, wow. Like, this is useful. It's like, bloop, 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 bloop. And before refrigeration, it was still fine. Because look, it's wrapped up in a shell. There's stuff hanging off of trees that you can just shove in the hole in your face. <laughs> and it will keep you alive. And that stuff was made by starlight out of thin air. Because there's a giant ball of fire in the sky that you guys try to ignore or you don't look at because it'll make you go blind. Or you pay lots of money for special lenses to protect your eyes from it. But that ball of fire is a star and it's hitting trees and the trees are taking that star power and they're grabbing your breath, oh, carbon dioxide, and using starlight to rip it in half and give you back fresh air and take the carbon from that carbon dioxide and make it into fruit. And then you can take the fruit and it's got the star energy in it and you can put it in your face. <laughs> That's where we live. And so in those early days, there's the bird walking around with just things coming out of its backside, and eventually, we got hungry enough to try them. <laughs> and also, there's these other creatures, and they have this big swinging bag underneath them. And they're just eating all the green stuff made by the star. And at some point, there's a bold young man who says, I'm going to crawl under there and squeeze that. <laughs> I'm gonna grab onto it and squeeze it into a bucket. And then I'm gonna let it sit. And then I'm gonna scrape off the top, which is, you know, turns out mostly fat after it sits. And then I'm gonna find this giant grass in another part of the world. I'm gonna burn it, evaporate everything out and find these sugar crystals. And then I'm gonna need some ice. And then we have ice cream. Throw in some vanilla beans, all these different pieces. But it all started with a guy crawling under a very large animal. It's like God hid that there. Chocolate took forever to invent. There's so many things like that, so many flavors and gems that are hidden in this world, in this fantastical world, that take forever to discover. But eventually, we do, and it's been there the whole time. Generations and generations of people never knew what ice cream was or what would happen when you stirred the fatty part off the liquid that came out of the sack under the big animal and you mixed it with this bean and that crystal from that grass while wrapped in snow. But now we do, and we're not going back. <laughs> but there's more things like that. There's a lot more things like that. They're going to be everywhere. Tastes and flavors we still haven't discovered. Things the starlight can do we still haven't figured out. There's a lot of those things. This is a fantasy world. You live in it, and you're telling stories every day with your lives. And if you want to tell stories formally, like another layer with a novel, with a film, or something like that, you have a chance to affect other characters who are also writing their own stories to change their loves and their hates and to try to get them to tell better stories with their lives. That should ultimately be the goal for our engagement. Your immune system matters a lot, and one of the most important aspects of it is what you love. Loving God and loving his personality as it's manifested in this creation, loving the things that he's done, loving all this craziness from the caterpillars to the ice cream to the chocolate will help make you more and more impervious to the secular, godless despair that they're peddling. To the eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. This is a world where it took us a long time to figure out whiskey is pretty fantastic. Coffee, long time, but man, I'm glad we did. Wine, we've known about that for a long time. And it's great. And God loves it. Love what he loves, and it will be much easier to resist like whatever is hot on Twitter or whatever show everybody else is watching and loving so much because it will always pale in comparison to the stories that God is telling, the stories that God has told, and the stories that you get to tell with your own lives. The stories you tell are for keeps. You might be just a fussy teenage girl now. You might be a sulky, introverted teenage boy now. But God gave you a bunch of narrative, one second per second, one day per day. It's going, you have to do it real time. And guess what? You have a death scene. It's coming. 
All of us are going to have one. Some of you will die young. Some of you will die medium. Some of you will die old. God knows. You have a death scene and you are marching towards it. You could have a clock on your wrist that told you exactly how many seconds you have left and it could be counting down. That number exists and it is counting down. You have a certain amount of time to tell stories with your lives that will affect the lives of others, that will honor God. And the more you love his taste, his flavors, and his narratives, the more impervious you're going to be to the lies of the world. So start there with the ice cream. And know that that's directly from him, and don't ever taste it again without thinking of his wild design. He even had to invent the, the little weird cells on this wet muscle in the hole <laughs> that would even enjoy it. He had to invent both sides of that. Any questions? Yes. So it just kind of goes with what you were talking about it earlier today in your first talk. But what do you think is the most significant way or the most important way that you personally or any of us of our kind that would be going into that Hollywood business, how can we shine a light in that kingdom? By being more like God. Um, I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So if I'm nice to people, even if they're nasty, if I'm doing my thing and I'm, I'm trying to walk around like I'm carrying a tray of freshly baked cookies, where I go places and I talk about how great, this is kind of funny, but it's weird to go talk about how great your life is. I mean, think about how often people fuss to each other in this group. How many of you, this I won't ask you to raise hands, but how many of you, I'll change it a little bit, how many of you had somebody else tell you how hard their life is this week? Yeah. That's so stupid. Thunderingly stupid. You're all sitting on a ball of mostly lava going Mach 86 around a star. <laughs> and you still have time to tell people like, my mom just doesn't get me. <laughs> or, I really like him, but he's not looking at me. Why won't he look at me? <laughs> Mach 86. 86 times faster than noise around a star right now. With a heart that's pumping, with brain waves that are working somehow, and we get all stuck in this little petty, this pettiness. When I go into a room... It's full of executives, and we all start by talking about how much our lives are terrible, or how, how hard it is. It's like, even the Starbucks barista, I drive through, and he's like, boy, this heat is awful, isn't it? And I always say something like, I'm loving it. <laughs> I'm having a great time. It's fantastic. Like, it's weird, you can just feel it. Like, there's a fire millions of miles away, and it's so strong that I can feel it on my face. <laughs> Isn't that weird? And then I drive off, and there's some guy in a green apron going like... <laughs> so if, if I go into a meeting, and I'm talking to people, and I'm talking about how much, how awesome my kids are, how much I like my kids, how much I like where I live, how much I love my wife, how awesome it is, we're having a great time. It's like, we go to the lake, it's going to be amazing, we're going to the lake, I'm fired up, it's going to be really fun. We just got back from Scotland, it's going to be really fun. Or I've got two drivers now and Lucy's going to hopefully not wreck the car as often as Rory has. <laughs> you know, if I'm, if I'm talking, he's never really all the way wrecked it. <laughs> but it's, uh, sorry, Rory. But uh, if I'm talking about how great it is, how awesome life is, it's just weird. You show up and you hand out cookies. You're just the cookie guy. You're the guy who comes in and like now I show up and at first it'd be like, why do you live in Moscow, Idaho? Why? I mean, don't you want to be down here where it's amazing? And then afterwards, they're like, man, you've got it figured out. We have to come visit. Because I'm, I'm just being grateful. I'm walking around being grateful for the narrative that God's put me in. And I'm always looking for opportunities to mess up the hair of the people I'm meeting with. But in like an affectionate way. You know, so we're talking. And it's like, hey, yeah, isn't this fantastic? It's great. Don't you love that phase with your kid? It's like, you know that toddler that you were just telling me how awful it is, potty training? I'm like, oh yeah, it's fun. Isn't that great? It's such a wild time. <laughs> Don't worry, you'll look back on this and think it was easy. 
I was like, it's gonna pass. It'll be like, whatever. Don't don't sweat it. It's like it's it is weird. I've ended up in lots and lots of conversations that are quite serious, just because of all the trivial conversations that were not serious at all. Like because none of them are happy. A producer friend of mine came up here not too long ago, and the conversation afterwards from them was, I have never seen so many people married who are not just angry and fussing or divorced. Everybody I know who is married who's your age is either divorcing, divorced, or miserable. You're like, oh, that's too bad. <laughs> Why do you think that is? You know, and, you, and you have a big conversation. You end up talking about abortions. You end up talking about the dark side of their false life. It's like where they try, to, they try to be party kids, but they're actually murdering babies to keep it going. And it really weighs on them, and there's lots of guilt. And it comes out just because you're handing out cookies. So as far as the stories go, I want them to matter. I want them to grab people. I want them to have an aroma of truth and makes them yearn for something deeper and more fulfilling with their own lives. But then in my own life, in my own conversations with them, I just want to be the happy, funny guy who always has a chocolate chip cookie to hand out. And that's, that's the goal. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, yeah, uh, there's racism in Hollywood. So as Christians, what action items should there be? The thing that's kind of ironic here is the racism in Hollywood is primarily perpetuated by the racism of Europeans. Uh, and it, it's a whole business model problem. So for a long time, the way movies would be funded, studio, this is like recent past, the last you know, decade, two decades, studios would try to pre-sell movies into France and Russia and Germany to theaters. And so they go to German theaters and Russian theaters and French theaters and Asian theaters and say, hey, we've, we've got a movie. Will you pay us in advance for it? And then we can make it. And so they take those foreign sales and then they would use them to make the movie. And so in America, where it didn't matter if you had a black lead or a white lead, it didn't affect the box office when it came to actors. You know, it, it really was irrelevant. They could go for Will Smith or Denzel or anybody else that they you know, happened to like that summer. So it, Jamie Foxx, like it, did, it didn't much matter. Uh, but even in Canada, this is one of those things I probably shouldn't say on camera, but I'm going to anyway. Even in Canada, there was a movie with Gerard Butler in it and Jamie Foxx in it. And Jamie Foxx um, was the lead. Gerard Butler was the villain. And they had to switch it on the poster and put Gerard Butler front and Jamie Foxx in the back, even though Gerard Butler was the villain, to try to get people to go. Because they just didn't go. And so Germans, Russians, uh, even in Asia, uh, there's a movie called Hancock, uh, where it's a, it's a biracial marriage. Uh, Charlize Theron, Will Smith, Asian theaters wouldn't carry it because it was a mixed race marriage. And so Asian theaters refused to carry it. They lost tens of millions of dollars. So Hollywood, because it's all about the money, began saying things like, we should use white guys almost exclusively when we're trying to go out. So one of the few good things in my mind about Black Panther uh, is the fact that it's proving to people like, mythologically, it's a broken, hot mess, just so you know. It's a mess. Uh, also, philosophically, it doesn't have a clue. But the thing I like about it a lot is the fact that it was proving to L.A. that international box office doesn't have to be white. Like, a good story, a fun story, a story that grabs people, it doesn't matter what the skin color is, people will show up. So that's new. That's a new thing, and it kind of mattered. Uh, so I had a movie pitch, very, very talented actor attached, uh, black, British, a uh, guy from London attached, pitched a movie producer, a studio exec, not a producer, who said, oh, I love him. He's so talented. He's amazing. Can you find me someone white? It's like, what? No. I'm not going to. Why? He's like, well, I need to sell it into Germany, and they're not going to give me any money in advance because they won't watch black people. In, in Germany, in Russia, in France. So it's kind of weird, like we th the progressives have told us that Europe is way ahead of us, but it's actually a little bit flipped. I mean, we are, after all, the ones who elected a black president. And 
Politically, you could disagree with them, but when's that gonna happen? Show me when that's gonna happen in Russia, England, France, Germany, anywhere else uh, that's predominantly white. So it's, um, that's kind of, that's the way it is. And the business model's changing, and it's going to streaming. And so it's kind of breaking by itself. And then Black Panther helped kick it down, you know, in some ways too. So I don't think we as Christians really have to do anything. It was just a broken model. And it was all about the money and it's collapsing. Behind the camera. So Harry Potter, what do I think of Harry Potter? It's good that we're on camera for this. Uh, <laughs> ultimately, for a, an author like myself to kibitz about Harry Potter is gonna come off like sour grapes, right? I mean, like she's wildly successful, way more successful than I am. I can be very happy with how I've done and where my books have gone around the world, and I am very grateful for that. It was very out of my control, but this is, it feels weird snarking at somebody who sold you know, way more. Um, so I'm not gonna do that, but I will say they're very fun parts of them. Uh, philosophically, it's a mess when it comes to good and evil. Uh, she doesn't understand boys, <laughs> period. And Harry Potter is functionally, after book four on, is functionally a teenage girl. Um, <laughs> And that's because that's what she knew. You know, it's so like she has a daughter, she is a woman. So she didn't write a teenage boy convincingly. Um, but most importantly, my single biggest criticism is that the, the books are written as if they're written by a person who does not believe in magic at all. She does, she does not buy what she's selling. She does not think magic is a real thing. And that's why she's casual about using it the way she uses it. And the, the difference between good magic and bad magic is the difference between driving 35 in a 35 mile an hour zone versus driving 45. It's, it's totally arbitrary. So it's not actually ontologically different. So it's, it's an arbitrary thing for her. So I, I have a problem with the fact that she doesn't believe in magic. I do believe in magic. But let me end on a good note about them. I am incredibly grateful to her for having done what she did, for being that successful, because it benefits every other fantasy novelist. So I have benefited from her success and I'm grateful to her for it. I'm gonna do one more, I'm gonna do one no, more, no. one more. Clap right it there, up, clap right it up, there. Clap it up. Oh, damn, it's not my fault, not my fault. I'm on a schedule, I'm on a schedule. <laughs>